So I put the um, uh, the slide links to in the chat. Okay. So I, I guess we could start. Uh huh. So I think I I stopped last time at some of the exercises from from the numerical differentiation part of the of the chapter. Um, I think most most of them are, you know, you could sort of like repeat some of the code that is available in the in the text. Um, there were just a couple of things to mention. One is that the one of the exercises asks you to sort of like apply the finite difference formulas, coded coded from scratch, uh, and you're given this function f sine two x, and then you have these nodes, and then you're asked to look at the accuracy. So I think this is more or less straight, very very straightforward. Um, the only thing that is uh, of note is that in section 5.4, the accuracy is not as, it, it's not really established yet. So there's a sequencing thing that is off in this part, but in, in terms of computing the finite difference formulas, it's relatively straightforward. And what this shows is that the centered difference formulas are are accurate up to the second uh, second decimal point, but the forward and the backward ones are not very accurate. Uh, in that sense, the center difference formulas are preferred in 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 this context. There would be exceptions to that, and uh, I think I'll I'll get to that later on. The other exercise is sort of like it, if you go back to the finite difference stuff you will notice that there are tons of these formulas and you have to generate these weights okay or at least you have to you have to either go through interpolate then integrate uh, sorry interpolate then differentiate uh to get the weights for the function values uh and there's a way to get this more automatically and it's using the fd weights um function that is available uh in the book so let me just show you where it is so this is the function okay and one thing that is of note about this uh function is that it's sort of like recursively defined so you have this uh so it's a function fd weights and then you'll notice that there's another function weight here but it uses weight once again inside the function weight so that's something that is uh that may be of interest here the the way they constructed this um the code for FD weights. I didn't go through the <clears throat> I didn't go through the details of uh, of this function, but I just wanted to point out that one of the lines here is unnecessary. This one you don't use it at all in in this code. Um, so. It's really just a matter of applying this FD weights and then so that you don't have to actually necessarily derive the weights uh, your, by hand. And then afterwards to calculate these approximations to the first, second, third, and fourth derivatives of, F's, oh, of, F, of F in this situation. Uh, the function F is... Uh, as you may notice, if you take the derivative, it's minus e to the minus x. And then if you take the second derivative, it would be e to the minus x back again. So there would be sort of like every odd ordered derivative will be the same. And then every even or even ordered derivative will be the same. So that is sort of like exploited in, in this part to calculate the errors, okay? in specifically in lines three and four, okay? Okay, so that, so so I encoded sort of like the the mapping of the function f, the mapping of the derivative, okay, the first derivative, and then it's only these two that will alternate as you go as you go uh, an order higher. Um, another thing that is of note in this exercise is that the h was set fixed at point two, okay, and. If you calculate the first der derivative, the error for the center difference is not bad, but as you increase the order of the derivative, okay, the error is uh 
is getting much larger than before. Okay, so that's something that is uh, of note in 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 this part. Okay, the the other exercise is about generating the the table from scratch as well but you want to see the the weights as fractions so so there's an option to do that and it's you're asked to explore that in 5.4.4 and um the code is really very very direct and it uses the code that is already available in that section as well and you would notice that <clears throat> you would notice these things you have one one slash slash one, which means one over one, and this is minus two over one, and then this is one over one. And I, yeah, sorry. And you'll have all of these weights uh, showing up here. And you could use, and, and sort of like, instead of manually getting those values from the table, you could just do it using FD weights and then using this rational, uh function available in julia yeah sorry and then the other one the remaining exercise that i did was exercise 5.5.1 where you're sort of like asked to look into the uh convergence and you're also asked to look into sort of like the two kinds of errors that you encounter in numerical differentiation, which I mentioned last time, which is that when you look into how you approximate the derivative, you can push this H, the spacing between nodes to be very small, but you don't want it to be too small. Uh, so there's a truncation error from the from the fact that you you don't really have access to the derivative and the other error is coming from the fact that uh, you are not using the, you're not using pen and paper. And that's coming from the roundup error. Uh, and exercise 5.5.1 gives you an opportunity to look into, look into a graph of the total error. And you can see that the error sort of like decreases, but af if you push H, to be too small, you will suddenly see that the error is increasing, okay? So this is sort of like, there's a sweet spot for the H and the sweet spot is sort of like discussed in, in the section as well. Um, in terms of new things in Julia, there's really not much new here. Uh, to be honest, you could directly use what you already have, uh, what you already have in before and in the chapter the probably something that is new here is that you could use a log two here instead of a log 10 because the h here is sort of like powers of two so that's why i use a log two for this part uh and then you could flip the axis because here you you see h in the horizontal axis the h is sort of like decreasing okay so that's probably the sort of like the design thing that is uh new here yeah so that's is it, yeah is there really is there truly a trend in uh <clears throat> increasing yeah. error as the round off gets worse is that or is it just yeah so there there is a sweet there's a sweet spot and yeah, no, there's a sweet spot but it does get worse as you continually make it smaller because of the right because of the round off error okay i gotcha yeah i, th I think so yeah it's kind of counterintuitive when you think about it, right? You think, oh, I should just make eight smaller. It's always going to be better. <laughs> yeah. If if you're using pen and paper, I, the, I, the idea is that you're right in that sense. No? But the problem is that you're using uh, uh, numbers that have finite precision. So right. that's, uh, that's where the problem is coming from. But all subtractive cancellation. That's right. So that that's that's sort of like something to pay attention to right. as well, yeah. Okay, and then the remaining part is really this integration stuff, uh, sp specifically how to do numerical integration in sort of like 
if you have equally spaced nodes and the other part is when you want to do numerical integration for really uh like ma malevolent kind of functions no so how do you how do you deal with those kinds of uh situations in that in in the case where your functions are a bit uh, more complicated then you would have to be more um, how should I be? You have to be more judicious about the way you choose these nodes, or how you, uh, how you're gonna, um, how you're gonna choose the spacing of the nodes. So uh, I'll talk about that later. But for the numerical integration part, the idea is again you have a function that is given to you. Um, one thing that they really point out here is that you really and this also applies to numerical differentiation, is that this function f doesn't have to have a closed form at all, but you do need to know the function values at at the nodes. Otherwise, you, you, you'll, you'll never be able to apply these formulas at all. So this might this is an advantage, but it's not much of an advantage if you really if if you don't know the function very well at a large number of nodes, especially if you want to really push the number of nodes uh, to infinity, for example. Um, so the idea for this section is to just split. So you have these endpoints T sub zero and T sub N uh, and uh, they're called A and B, okay? And you split it into N sub intervals of equal length. So there are N plus one nodes and then N sub intervals. And the length of each subinterval is b minus a divided by n. And every node is really t sub i is starting from the starting point plus uh, some factor of h. And then this is sort of like the same mantra just like before. If you want to get the numerical integration formulas, the idea is interpolate, then, inter then integrate. It's similar to when you did uh, numerical differentiation where you interpolate, then differentiate, okay? So, uh, and it turns out that if you choose these hat functions from before and uh, do, you could actually reconstruct uh, the so-called trapezoid uh, rule, okay? So, and it, and it turns out these hat functions have very nice forms and then you'll get the trapezoid rule as well. And this trapezoid rule is coming from the fact that uh, when you have a function f, so let me just show you a function here, let me see. Yeah, so so essentially you split this interval here into equal sub, uh, of into intervals, into sub intervals of equal length. And then for each, Subinterval, you can think of this as sort of like there's a trapezoid that you could inscribe in this uh in this part. And you basically calculate the area of these uh of these trapezoids and then glue them together. So that's yeah, there's a picture farther down. Ah, there's a picture further down? Uh yeah. Oh ah, yeah, there. That's it. Right <laughs> Thank, thanks for that. So so that's essentially what you're what you're trying to do there. So when you do the when you use the hat functions uh, and you you try to find the integral of this hat function, you could actually derive the trapezoid rule from sort of like um, from a higher level rather than from a more intuitive level, which is, you know, you just put in these trapezoids and then glue, glue them together. So, uh, and this is where you get the, the link between interpolation and numerical integ integration. So uh, so that's the trapezoid rule. And it's easy to implement because you just need to know the function values at all the nodes that, you, that you've chosen. And this is where not knowing the closed form is a good thing, but it's also a bad thing in the sense that if, if you don't know any one of these values, then you sort of like have fewer, it's gonna be harder to compute this one because you have mis missing values, okay? So yeah. Uh, and then a, a lot of the time is really spent on calculating the error of um, the error of the approximation. And there is an upper bound, and the the proof for that is I think straightforward. And uh, the the upper bound is that the you have the upper bound is order h square. Okay, 
So it's second order accurate. And then if you really want to see or to flesh out what this OH2 term looks like, you could use the so-called Euler-McLaurin formula. And I don't think they proved this one, but you could, it's available there directly. And it's given by this uh, expression that you see here. And you can see the H square term, order H square term fleshed out, and it involves the first derivatives. Okay, so you need information about the first derivatives if you really want to sort of like get a sense of how much this, uh, you know, quantitatively what this error is exactly rather than just knowing that it's order H square. So H is something that you can control. F prime is something that you cannot control. Okay, so that's why most, most what people would do is to try to deal with, uh, with making H as small as possible. But the bottom line is that the trapezoid rule is uh, second order accurate. Mm, yeah. So, so that's that's essentially sort of like the the key part there, and then the remaining part is sort of like the refinements. Okay. So, you could get fourth order accuracy. Okay. If you have a way to get rid of this part, so if you could get rid of this part then the remaining part will be order H4. So what that what I mean by that is you have to find some way to incorporate this into your calculation of the integral. So I is the true value of uh, the integral, and then TFN is the approximation. So if I have a way to put this on the other side or incorporate this into TFN, then the remaining part will be order H4. But that requires you to know f prime, and uh, it's not so bad in the sense that f prime could be approximated. So if you have a numerical differentiation formula for them, then you could approximate these things. You don't need to know. Uh, you you only need to know f prime b and f prime a. So so as long as you know how to apply those formula, the numerical differentiation formulas at those endpoints then that should be fine. So this is the case where a centered difference formula doesn't make sense because you're at the end points. So in that sense, you replace F prime A with a forward difference formula and you, you, and you, because you only have values of the nodes to the right of A. And then for B, you need, you, you need a backward difference because you have the values of F to the left of B. So, so that's sort of like the the idea. So you replace these things with function values f according to the numerical differentiation formulas and then take them off from TFN. And that will give you fourth order accuracy. And this is the Gregory integration formula that you will see in 5.6.2. Okay. So if you do the algebra, you'll get that directly. Um, the other way to get fourth order accuracy is to use what is called extrapolation or you do interpolate then integrate again, okay? So the book explores the extrapolation angle while the exercise explores the interpolate then integrate angle. If you want to do the interpolate then integrate angle, uh, this is a lot of algebra, but the idea is that you interpolate a quadratic uh, within that sub interval, and then do the do the algebra, do the integration, and then do the algebra later on, and you'll get Simpson's formula directly. Uh, the exercise in the book gives you the guidance for that, and it is straightforward to do, but just painful to do. Um, extrapolation is much more interesting, and that will be in the next slide. But the idea behind getting this fourth order accuracy, okay, the, these two ways of doing it is analogous to what you might have seen in statistics where you do bias corrections, okay? So here you could think of I as your, you know, your parameter of interest. And then this TFN is sort of like your estimator and you have an asymptotic expansion as you can see here, and then you're sort of like trying to get rid of this OH square term either directly or indirectly. So if you do it directly, you're doing Gregory. 
And if you're doing it indirectly by sort of like doing this extrapolation argument, uh, then you're doing Simpson. Okay. So the first one, when you do, when you estimate this bias directly, okay, is so that, that you estimate this bias directly and the other one you estimate the bias uh or the oh squared term indirectly uh it's more akin to the jackknife in 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 a sense so so that's sort of like the analogs uh in statistics and then you could sort of like push this even further by fleshing out the sixth the oh six term and then that means that you have to get rid of the oh four term after getting rid of the oh squared term Okay. So how exactly does uh, this extrapolation work? The idea is that you have the true value of the integral is the approximation plus something that is remaining. Okay, And these are powers of h square, h4, and so on. And then you could rewrite this in terms of uh, the number of subintervals, or if you wish, the number of nodes. So h is... Uh, inversely proportional to n. So you could rewrite this as n minus two and n minus four. And this should be a bit more familiar for statistics audiences. So it's kind of, it's really an asymptotic expansion. And then the idea is if you want to do extrapolation, the idea is to get rid of this n minus two term. If you want to get rid of this n minus two term, you need to find, you, you have to have another equation that will allow you to get rid of this part. And the idea is let's double the number of subintervals. If you double the number of subintervals, then this n here becomes 2n. And then you have 2 to the minus 2, and that will give you the 1 fourth that you see here. So if you want to get rid of c2n minus 2, I have to multiply both sides of this equation by 4, and then subtract it from the, and then subtract this part from this. Okay. So 4i, 4i here and then i here will give you 3i and then if you do the subtraction you'll be removing this c2 and minus 2 part afterwards and that's the idea form a linear combination of those two expansions in order to get the fourth order accuracy so why is, sorry. Why is this called extrapolation uh i i think i think you could you could think of that as like if you have uh if you increase the number of nodes or the number of subintervals, you're sort of like stretching, you're you, you you're extrapolating the the shape of F. I think that's the that's how I would interpret it. So you need to know more values of F. So you're so in a sense relative to the situation where you only have like n nodes, for instance, you don't necessarily need to know the what the function looks like outside of those nodes. But if you want to use extrapolation, you need to know how F looks like or what F looks like outside of these nodes. So in that sense, you're extrapolating. I don't know if that that sounds like a cop-out, but uh, I think that, that is how I would interpret it. Well, that's better than what I got, which is not that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I also found it a little counterintuitive because it's like, it, it's like infilling. Yeah. And so, and usually in statistics, we say extrapolation is on the outside. So like outside A and B. Yeah. But this is more of like an in, infilling, I would think about it. Exactly. So, so like, so you have A and B, right? So you, you're, you're really, you're really, you're really stuck in that part. Right. And uh, so you're, if you multiply the number of sub intervals, you definitely have to know what F looks like as you get finer and finer, right? So in a sense, you're ex extrapolating to air regions where you don't necessarily know a lot about F. So that means that you need to make more, uh, make more assumptions about, about F in that, in that set. So I, I think that's how I would put it. Yeah. Thanks for that. So if you, if you do that, then you get this uh, Simpsons formula. So you have the four four times the value of the your approximation at two two n subintervals minus the approximation with n oh not, yeah with n subintervals where you take the difference and then you divide by three. The three is coming from the fact that you have 
four times I here and then I here, okay? And that gives you Simpson's formula. And then you could push this even further to six order accuracy, but now you start with Simpson's. Okay? You double again, and then you get rid of the N minus four term to get this uh, N minus six accuracy. Uh, and that's Romberg integration, okay? And uh, I think I'll skip this part, but I put the I put some of the details in the slides actually. And the idea is that you could use interpolate and integrate. And I've already done one of the exercises in the slides as well, indirectly. And you could get to the point where you'll have an explicit form of what Simpson's formula looks like in terms of the function values themselves, rather than in terms of the approximations of the integral, okay? And then there are a couple of things to note is that you have to show that this algebra that you've done here actually matches Simpson's formula. Uh, so again, this is purely algebraic man manipulations, but you have to pay attention to the fact that if you double the number of subintervals, your H is also changing. So once you realize that, you'll be able to get the algebra correctly. Another thing that is of note uh, related to this exercise and the previous things that I mentioned is that there's a bit of redundancy in the way you're going to be using F in the sense that you're going to be evaluating F at the same set of points. So when you double the no, the no, the no, the if you double the number of subintervals, there would be places where f has already been evaluated. Okay, so in that sense, you have to reuse them, and the the code uh, available in the book uh, effectively makes use of this fact. Okay, and then the remaining part is really just to sort of like doing these exercises. And I think I might skip this part because there's really not much new here, except for the fact that uh, I have to sort of like, sort of like manually do some of the Simpson stuff because the trapezoid rule is built in. And here clearly I didn't re, I didn't exploit the, the fact that F was, evaluated already before. So this is me being lazy. And, uh, but yeah, so if you really want to refine this, you could at the cost of more lines. Uh, that's the thing that I want to point out here. This is not a problem of the book, but a problem is a laziness thing from, from my end. Uh, but for the Simpsons part, you really have to do it manually, okay? That's that's what you would would see here, but essentially what you will see at the end of the day is that if you increase the number of nodes, uh, of course the error is is getting smaller, but those that have higher order accuracy, like the Romberg one, you already get very very good, uh, very very good convergence with just twenty nodes. Okay, so that's uh, what you get from from this part, and I I think I'm gonna skip the remaining part and move to this other exercise, where I'll just make a mention that it might feel annoying to see this kind of function here, but there was a point to this function that you may not realize, and it's coming from the fact here you would notice that the euler maclaurin formula has a nice sort of like pattern and it's the difference of odd ordered derivatives are showing up at the end points and this function here in exercise 5.67 which you may feel is like ridiculous but actually has the property that the uh, odd ordered derivatives, and I think the even ordered derivatives too, uh, they all zero out. So when you when you take the difference f prime b and f prime a, they will they will cancel out. So that's the thing that you would notice here. 
So in that sense, you would get almost an exact answer when you apply a numerical integration formula and whatever is left is really a uh, round, uh, round of error. So I think that's the main point that I that I think is in 5.6.7. And then the other thing that I also want to point out in, in the code that I show for the exercise is this line here, line eight, where I put a layout. This is not in the text, but I wanted to sort of like show how to do the plots for uh if you want to put them on the same layout so you have these subplots that you see here and there's a command there's an option called layout is equal to l where l is sort of like how you do the how you lay out the canvas so to speak um so you can and think the, of this yeah um a and b is that what you chose or is that the like you have I think to do it in the alphabet now this is one that I forgot already. Sorry, but I think uh, I think it shouldn't matter whether you use no no. Oh now now I'm not sure. So uh, I don't know now. Hmm. Yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> but and I should... had another question about on the other one. Uh, the step. What's the step function? Step function. Yeah. Yeah, in this code. Uh, oh, yeah. I think. Oh my god, I forgot how. Sorry, let me. <laughs> ah, this is the increments. The increments. So, like, if you have one column ten, the step is one. Yeah. Okay. So this is a built-in function. So yeah. Sorry. Okay. No worries. <laughs> yeah. The a vacation really ruins the, your memory, you know. So <laughs> um yeah. So that's uh sort of like the the new parts here. Uh thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. And then the remaining part is this adaptive uh integration part and the idea is that the idea is best seen, I think, in in demo five point seven point one, where you have really a a, a function that is behaving weirdly at this part, you know, remain uh, at this part from three to four relative to zero to three, and the idea is that you in this situation you have too much variation and it might not work very well, and the idea is to use something called adaptive integration. And the idea is that you want to have more nodes on more difficult regions of the function. And you have to decide which are which parts are the difficult parts. So that's that's sort of like how the what the code would kind of look like. And it doesn't, it may not work very well, and there are exercises for that. Uh, it may not work very well because it may become slower because you have to evaluate function values more often, okay? More often relative to the, to the case where you have equally spaced nodes. The other thing is that you have to repeatedly evaluate the integral, you have to evaluate the integral, uh, sorry. Another reason why it would be, it might not work very well is that if the integral itself is not the, the, the parameter of interest, so to speak, that it's sort of like an intermediate intermediate uh, step. So if you're solving an integral equation, for example, or, or something that requires the integral as an intermediate step, then it becomes uh, more problematic. And when you want to decide which parts are the difficult parts, you need to estimate the error. And when you estimate the error, subtractive cancellation, uh, shows up again and they provide an algorithm for adaptive integration and the idea is that you have this interval that is available to you and then you split it into four sub intervals and you find this trapezoid um 
apply the trapezoid rule, and then afterwards uh, estimate the error using this quantity that you see here. Uh, the details about about how why this would be the error is available in in the section as well. Okay, but the the idea is that you're not using all nodes. Okay, that's that's what you should notice in the first steps. It's here you're using only one one node, two nodes, and then four uh four nodes. Okay, and then if the error is small enough, then you have to stop. Okay. And then if the if it's not small, then you have to split it into two subintervals, and then you repeat the previous steps. Essentially, that's uh, what the adaptive integration algorithm looks like and how it's coded. The code you could see here in function 5.7.2. Okay, so you would notice this is exactly what what I just uh, described. Okay. And you would see the part where you have these starting points, okay? And then you calculate three, you apply the trapezoid rule three times, you estimate the error, and then you have these uh, if-then statements, if-else statements where you are looking at um, whether the error is too large or too, or if the error is too large or small enough. And the small enough is governed by this uh, tolerance that you see here, this tall times this one plus. This is hard coded here. The only thing that you could modify here is really this uh, tolerance uh, part, okay? So that's essentially the adaptive uh, integration algorithm, you know, on, on the surface. And another thing that is of note in the function is that this int adapt, is defined here and you see it used within the function that's sort of like the new new thing that uh that you that you have to notice from this part <clears throat> and then and then the remaining part are really exercises about about uh the the number of nodes counting the number of nodes that you use when you use the adaptive integration algorithm, okay? And to sh really show you that uh, that adaptive integration takes a bit more time to achieve the same level of tolerance. No? So to, to achieve the same level of accuracy. So another thing that, that is used in the section is sort of like this quad GK function, which they take as the exact value, okay, quote unquote, okay. So I don't know the details about this quad GK, only that the section sort of like treats the treats the output of quad GK as the exact uh, answer to the integral. And the three functions that you're asked to investigate are these three functions. Uh, the interval, the endpoints are are given in this axis as well, okay? okay? So here for this first function is from zero to four, for this next function is from minus one to 10, I think. And then this is from minus three to three, some, something roughly like that. And you would notice that this adapt, here you have this uh, weird behavior here. And here you have a function value that dives very, very fast as it reaches minus one from the left, I'm oh, sorry, from the, from the right. And then you have cosine X cubed behaving like this very differently from uh, minus one to one. Okay. And this part is really, again, relatively straightforward. The only thing that is really new here is how to answer this exercise here where you're asked to estimate the number of nodes that would be required uh, based on the euler maclaurin formula. And to see this, you go back to the euler maclaurin formula and note that H is really B minus A over N. And you could solve for N actually uh, in, in this situation so that you could sort of like get a sense of uh, how many how many nodes you're gonna be using? 
and uh, that's the only thing that is really that is really new here to achieve that absolute error of ten to the minus eight. Okay, and I'll just mention that I hard coded sort of like the the calculation, and this comes from the Euler Maclaurin formula. You do do some algebra and then code it, and you could calculate the number of nodes uh, from there. And you would notice that um, here for this first function, adaptive integration uh, only requires 209 nodes. But if you use the tra if you use the trapezoid rule and uh, the Euler Maclaurin number of nodes based on Euler Maclaurin, you need 16,000. And then for this function, you have 205, and then this is 62,000 for if you want to use uh, Euler Maclaurin, okay? If you use the trapezoid rule as by default, equally spaced nodes, okay? And here, for this function, I got something weird. I only needed, I needed 945 uh, nodes for adaptive integration, but for Euler Maclaurin, I don't I, I couldn't calculate it because the uh I get a complex number uh as a, a as a result. So I'm uh, I didn't really go through the details more about how you know really investigating this even further, but that's where I ended for this part. Okay. And then the remaining part are really more of like exercises about. Uh, improper integrals where where the function when you evaluate at the endpoint is undefined. Similarly for this one, asking asking you to plot this function, and then the other remaining exercise is really what happens when you want to uh, look into a situation where you only need the integral, the value of the integral as an intermediate step. So you're asked to sort of like solve for the value of X so that this thing is equal to 0.95. Okay. So that that's sort of like uh, a thing that that is explored in this exercise. And uh, you would see that you need you really need to adjust the tolerances to make things work. And I think I should stop here because uh, it's 645 just in time. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> yeah. Look great. Yeah, you, always, you jump. You're you're next, right? Correct. Yeah, I'm next. Uh, I guess I'm going to be doing the uh, differential equations, and uh, following week is actually a break for daylight savings time. Is that right? Yeah. And then finishing up differential equations. So. Okay, I'll sign up. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah so, great. So after after that, how, how are we gonna how are we gonna divvy up the next next ones? So you have we have seven, eight, and nine next, I think, for the three of us. Uh yeah, let me bring up the thing because actually I'm gonna be out one of these weeks. Unless it happens to be seven. That. Unless it's coincidentally in the week to... Oh. Well that's convenient. <laughs> Never mind. I think the week so, of the mode is during that daylight savings time thing. So we double check that. So so we're meeting next week or no? We're we're meeting next week, yes. right? Yes. Yes. And then two weeks. The... No. Okay. So 